Good morning and welcome. It's now the top of the hour, so we're going to go ahead and get started this morning. I'm Development Coordinator for the Military Families Learning Network, and it's my absolute pleasure to welcome you to today's session. The session is hosted by the Military Caregiving Concentration Area of the Military Families Learning Network. Webinar resources, including the slides we'll be utilizing today, can be found at learn.extension.org slash event slash 3261. These are under the event materials section at the bottom of that page. Additionally, if you have need of tech support during today's webinar, please send us an email at milfamln at gmail.com. This address, along with the link to the slides I mentioned, is located in the important info pod to the lower right-hand corner of this page. The Military Families Learning Network is part of a DOD-USDA partnership for military families, connecting military family service providers and cooperative extension professionals to research and to each other through engaging online learning opportunities. You can explore more about our communities and resources at militaryfamilies.extension.org. We'd like to let you know that you can join our MFLN webinar email list to receive our monthly programming update by clicking on the link in the lower right of this slide. Finally, the MFLN is active on Facebook and Twitter, and we host an archive of all of our professional development sessions on YouTube. Also note that we are recording today's webinar, and we will post the archive recording to that learn.extension.org URL that I mentioned previously here in the next business day or two. At this time, I'd like to turn things over to Rachel Browner, who's the Program Coordinator for the Military Caregiving Team. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining. It seems like we have some folks from all over, so we're really excited about um, you being able to join us and today's presenter, uh, Dr. Barra Littman. Today's session, we're going to be discussing rebalancing work and life and be the model. So we really hope that this will be a great start to 20, 2018 excuse me, for every one of us. So Barra Littman is a licensed clinical psychologist a certified employee assistance professional, and a work-life professional. Dr. Littman manages some of the existing work-life programs at MIT and helps develop new programs and initiatives for MIT's faculty, staff, postdocs, and their families. And Barra provides individual consultations, seminars, support groups, and information resources concerning a wide range of work-life issues, including communication, parenting, aging, family support worldwide, and being more effective at home and at work, along with daily life and balance. So prior to joining MIT, Barra was the Vice President of Account Services for a national EAP and wellness company, and she provides EAP services, crisis and disaster response training, work-life coordination and consultation and accounts management to higher education and for Fortune 100 corporate clients. For the past 25 years, Barra has been consulting to human resources, managers, and employees, and organizations of all sizes, along with providing training, coaching, and counseling. She's created programs to enhance personal, family, and work well-being at all levels of organizations. And she's worked with unions and organizations with government funding and security clearance. Barra has also been a psychologist in behavioral health clinics and schools, working with children and their families. And before I turn over the presentation to Dr. Littman, I'd uh, like to pull up a poll to get a good idea of who's joining us today. And while you're filling out that poll, we'd also like, if you haven't already done so, please type in the chat pod where you're from. If there's more than one of you in your office, we really want to get to know you um, and engage with you throughout today's session. So this chat pod will be where we'll be able to engage with you. So feel free to um, com make comments, ask questions, um, talk back and forth amongst yourselves with your colleagues and peers if there are any similarities or questions that you may have. So please utilize that chat pod between myself and the rest of our military caregiving team and Dr. Littman will be monitoring that chat pod and um, providing resources and support. All right, without further ado, Dr. Littman, I will let you take it away. Great. Thanks, Rachel. Um, and to all of you, thank you to the Military Families Learning Network for this opportunity to present in your great webinar series. And then to all of you for joining us today from all over the country, different weather zones and different time zones. Um, delighted to be talking with you. 
Uh, just a little bit more about me. My passion is really helping people identify the tools they can use to live better, more fulfilling lives. Then I help people use those tools. When we need, um, when we need to fix a leaky sink, we go to a hardware store for the right tool. But when we need to fix a leaky life or a troubled relationship or work-life imbalance, it isn't as easy as walking to a store describing the problem and having some helpful person hand you a socket wrench. So today I'll present you with some different tools that have worked for many people when they take a few moments to assess their lives and choose to do something different. We'll look at how you spend your time, what your values and priorities are, and then how do we bring ourselves, our energy and our focus to our everyday tasks. We'll practice some minis. These are what I call very brief one to three minute activities that you can try today, tomorrow, and then choose what's going to work for you. The goal is to help you look at your work-life balance and then try to balance it to fit better with your values and goals. So let's start with a poll. Have you made a New Year's resolution yet? Can you all respond with a yes or a no? OK. Uh, it looks like two thirds of you approximately have not made a New Year's resolution, and one third of you have made a resolution. So the next question is, have you already broken your New Year's resolution? And for those of you who didn't make a New Year's resolution, you can think about if, you, if in the past how this would work for you. Um, so it looks like because a lot of people, two-thirds, hadn't broken their New Year's resolution, they still haven't, and people who've made a New Year's resolution haven't broken it, which is really fabulous. But here's the good news about this seminar. I'm not going to ask you to diet, exercise, be nice to your boss, or make the world a better place. I will ask you to become more aware of what is important to you. Often our New Year's resolutions are driven by what we should do or what others think we should do, not what, what is really important to us. So I'm going to ask you to pause during your day for a minute or two, rather than asking you to reshuffle your life and either add a big new list or feel deprived. As we talk about all we have to do, balancing it all, and what we want for 2018, take a moment and on a scale of 1 to 10, where 10 means being so stressed out you're about to pull your hair out, and 1's being pretty chill, nothing to do, no worries, maybe you won the lottery. Life is pretty good, just go on fishing. Take a moment and where are you on a scale of 1 to 10? Just note it, let a number come to mind. These are two extremes. If you're on the boat fishing, good for you. If you're on the other extreme about to pull your hair out, this is the workshop for you. Because balance is about finding a workable middle ground. The two extremes can happen and do happen. But what we do need is to have more flow, more flexibility and resiliency so that we have more well-being in all aspects of our lives. So this is a pie chart. And it's a pie of some of our various roles and the amount of time we spend in each area. This one is pretty balanced. If it were pie, it'd be well cooked, there'd be something for everybody, and it'd be yummy. Wouldn't we all like to have this balance? But that's because it isn't real. In reality, we frequently burn the edges of our life pies, which can create the sense of burnout, which can also feel like what we call compassion fatigue. And compassion fatigue is a state of emotional, physical, and mental exhaustion where you feel depleted, chronically tired, helpless, hopeless, and bad, and even cynical about yourself, work, life, and the state of the world. When we do look at our own life pie and how we really do spend our time, uh, the, the numbers from the, the Bureau of Labor, Labor Statistics show that we spend about 8.5 hours of our day at work. If we're parents with children in the home, we spend 
one to two hours per day on parenting activities, depending on the ages of the children, two to three hours in household activities, and five to eight hours on sleep. And of course, that varies per person. That leaves three to eight hours for social, spiritual, community, financial planning, exercise, and health, time alone with your significant other, time for helping family members like aging parents, to say nothing of time for you. And this evenly divided balance on this chart doesn't even reflect where our passion is, where our current life circumstances are, week to week changes. For example, when my parents were ill and dying, first one and then the others, the other six years of my life had a very different look as I traveled to take care of them, took them to doctor's appointments, and really spent a lot of my time away from them organizing aspects of their lives that they could no longer do on their own. And I'm sure many of you know about this, this juggling, as we call it. So realistically, this is more of what our lives look like, though different for each of us. And it didn't stop after my parents died because then my twin grandchildren were born. So then there was another rebalancing uh, juggling act that had to go on and I had to, to look at the demands of my time and energy. To help with perspective, I'm going to ask you to think about something uncomfortable, something we don't like to think about, which is the end of life. And I'd like to mention some famous dying words from Bob Marley. And he said, money can't buy life. And words that no one has ever heard on a deathbed, which are, I wish I had worked more. So what will you wish you had done more of as you move into later parts of your life? because you need to start taking control of that now. And if you have a piece of paper in front of you or your phone or whatever, take a moment now and write down your activities for your day and your week. Just jot them down. You're not going to get them all, but, but and I've given you a, a, a basic framework. And then estimate how much time a day you spend in each activity in hours. It doesn't need to equal 24 hours. It might equal 48 or 72 hours, which is how some of our days certainly feel. Um, but just guesstimate. We often can't do much to reallocate our time. We can tweak. We can make some adjustments. We can decrease social media and increase in-person time with teens. We can leave work on time and take a walk after work with a friend. But mostly we're on autopilot not thinking about what is important to us, which of the roles and responsibilities give us a sense of well-being. We often feel we have no control um, over these roles. So here's an experiment. Change it up for a day. One of the things I've learned working at MIT is uh, experiments are good. And actually, we, we call them pilots. And we say, let's do a pilot project. And everybody goes, yay, great. So I want you to figure out your pilot project around this, uh, which is to take a day and reallocate your time and basically try it on, like different clothing or a different kind of day. As an experiment, do this once a month. Take notes. Learn from your experiment. Be a scientist. What brings you energy and joy in the new schedule? And what drains you? How can you incorporate this self-knowledge into your other 29 days of the month? Or are you someone where it works to have a change-up day once a month as a way of rebalancing? So let's take a moment and look at what our values are. What is important really when we take time to think through who we are, what is important to us, and what are our life goals? Here's where we switch from quantity time, which is how much time we are spending in activities, to quality time. How much time are we really present in what we're doing? So this is a sample of life values. Think of this as underlying the previous chart. This is the meaning we bring to our activities. And I challenge you with the idea that most of us sleepwalk through the day, and then we don't sleep at night. So it's a lose-lose proposition. Rebalancing our work and life really means being mindful about what we're doing and what values we are expressing as we do it. Since there really are only 24 hours in the day, much as I, I try to expand that, 
what happens if we bring more of ourselves, more of our passion, our creativity, and joy to each part of our day? The rebalance starts happening as you rebalance your energy. And if you're a giving person, and that is part of your work and your home life, you may find that you are sacrificing other values, like time alone, or humor, or creativity. You might have the most boring job. You might have some negative feelings about someone you work with, though I'm sure none of you do. Or you might be struggling in a personal relationship or know somebody who is. If you focus on the negative, your total work-life pie will get burnt and there will be nothing left to feed anyone else, let alone yourself. But if you bring yourself, your values, your meaning to each of your activities and roles, you'll find more energy and have more to give. Rebalancing includes focus, compassion, mindfulness, and kindness. It includes focusing on the positive, but also includes saying no to some requests. And we'll talk more about this. The trade-off is more control, more well-being, and being in control of your pause button. So that in your day, we can ask ourselves, where does this request, this project, this activity fit in my life pie chart? Will it put me over the edge or burn up my pie? Or will I be able to bring my best self to this with my true values? So balance is really about well-being. And a few words about pr what promotes well-being. Living in line with our values is what gives us a sense of life well-lived. Social relationships and community are the core of happiness. There's been a lot of research about this. There are deep connections between our biology and being connected to others. And there was what's called a very happy people study in 2002 by two psychologists, Diener and Seligman, which concluded that very happy people have rich and satisfying relationships. While income is not highly correlated with happiness, Diener found that social relationships are. And balancing includes friends in different areas, friends at work, at home, and in the community. Now, one would think that money would buy happiness. Um, and it's true that financial stability is very important to our well-being. And there's uh, studies actually by behavioral econ economists that um, say that over about $75,000, depending on where you live in the country, that that's the cutoff for happiness, that over that, you're not happier. And under that, money can affect happiness. One of the drivers of our work-life balance, though, is money. We worry about it, and then often we don't do anything to deal with the worry. So think about whether you're dealing with it, setting realistic value-based goals around your money. Um, in the lottery, you may have read that uh, winning the lottery doesn't make people happier over time. In fact, it decreases happiness over time. So again, it's not about having a lot of money. It's about how you're uh, integrating it into your life. Community means connection to neighbors, your environment, your church, your PTA, politics, volunteering. This is another pillar of happiness and being part of something bigger than yourself. It's like rowing in a boat with crew or uh, any kind of a boat together. Everyone's pulling in the same direction. Humans are wired to caretake, to do things together. And then finally, uh, as part of the well-being, taking care of our sleep, our nutrition, and exercise. I know that when I get home after a tough day at work, where I feel like I didn't accomplish much, where I felt like others were getting in the way of my success, where I didn't have a single positive interaction with anyone, or at least it felt that way, did you ever have a day like that? When this happens, I'm not my best self when I come home to my husband. That can easily lead to more imbalance as we avoid each other, as I'm not so lovely to be around. I don't sleep well, and then I pick a fight with a friend or a child and throw myself into work to avoid all that family part of my life. We all know our worst selves. But what about moments of our best selves? A kind gesture, thank you, solving a problem. Who's your best self? Take a moment and jot down some aspects of yourself, your personality, your values, 
that represent your best self. If you can't think of anything, think about what someone else might say about you. How we show up with our best selves so that we are more in the moment with each part of our day and thinking less about what we should be doing, worrying less about the bills or a child, thinking less about regrets and what we call the woulda, shoulda, couldas. How do you show up at work? How do you bring your best self to work? Think about what you like at work. How do you remind yourself when you start slipping into the negative, the tired, the stress? And who are your cheerleaders at work that remind you of your best self? Make sure you have cheerleaders and thank them. Thanks and gratitude improves your mood and it increases productivity. And how do you show up at home? Do you remember to press your pause button before you enter your home after work? To breathe and bring your best self to those who love you the most? Interestingly, when I do counseling with couples and they're arguing in front of me and pitching daggers at each other with their eyes, I ask them, what would happen if you were like this at work? What would happen if you talked to your boss, your coworkers, or your customers like you were speaking to your significant other? They often look at me appalled and say, they would never be that way at work. And I ask them, why are you giving your best to work and not to your family and friends? So we're going to spend some time today reviewing ways to identify and maintain your best self. And we've got some, some comments here about stretching in the morning goes a long way, indeed, um, starting with exercise um, and also something about happiness and um, doing things that you're passionate about. So. All of you have a lot of wisdom about this already. So values, and these are some of our essential parts of, of our lives. Check in again with your core values, whatever they may be, art, laughter, kindness, time with others, time alone. Whatever they are, think about a time at work when you brought one of your key values into the workplace. How did you feel? One of my key values is listening which involves being quiet and still inside, which is sometimes hard to do, so that I can really hear what someone is saying, both verbally and non-verbally. Recently, I focused on really bringing this, more listening, to work. My boss kept complimenting me on various parts of my projects. I was surprised about the, the number of compliments until I realized that she felt listened to and therefore cared for by me and that rebalanced the energy I needed at that point in my work life. With your family and friends, when was the time you acted on a value at home or with a close friend? Watching a movie or putting aside the smartphone to look at each other directly in the eyes? Your community, sometimes I'll pick up a piece of litter every day or do what's called a random act of kindness every day for a week where I give money to a panhandler or let a car pull in front of me, or bring cookies to work. Financially, we've talked some about that. What's important to you that you'll spend time teaching your children and reviewing weekly and monthly? And last but not least at all, in fact, most important, what values about yourself are you honoring or not? So, People are, are writing in some great comments um, about putting a sticky note on, on her mirror saying, I'm important too, I love me. So all the ways that we can do our reminders. So tips for internal balance, and I'm going to spend some time uh, doing some activities with us today. Remember what it's like to try to balance on a bike or balance on one foot as you hop over a puddle or walk along a curb. Balance starts from an internal place. In Pilates, it's called the core. In rebalancing our lives, we think we have it. We think, OK, I got it set. I'm good. And then the world happens to us. Whack. Family, work demands, worries, finances, and more. So. Um, this is one of our first minis. This is one tool and one way to press the pause button. Breathing is something we usually don't think about. But conscious breathing a few times a day can enhance our well-being in many ways. Let's practice, and then I'll explain more about it. 
So there are many ways to breathe, and I'm just going to uh, do this one kind of breathing with you, which is breathing in on the count of four, holding for a count of one, breathing out double, which is for this the count of eight, and then holding. What's really important is breathing out slowly and steadily. If you do it with pursed lips as if you're blowing, blowing through a straw, that slows down your exhalation and makes it very steady. So it's going to be something like this. Breathe in, two, three, four, hold. Breathe out, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It might even sound like if you can hear that. Hold for one and repeat. So I'd like you to do this uh, on your own for three breaths. Take your time and go ahead now and take three breaths using this technique. Okay, I'm going to jump back in. Uh, hopefully you all got at least three breaths in. Before we go on to the next mini, does anybody have any comments about doing that breathing? Wait a moment just while the comments populate. And um, looks like that was good for, for one person and easy and effective. Yes. OK, so now I'm going to ask you to do one more part for the breathing. And this time, I want you to find your pulse. Now, if you don't find your pulse, you're fine. You're not dead. And I don't want you to worry about this. Um, but there are two. Uh, relatively easy places to find your pulse. One is on your wrist and one is your carotid artery which is below on your neck below your jaw and kind of up by your Adam's apple. And take a moment, find your pulse. If you don't find your pulse, don't bother and just do this breathing without doing that. So now what I'd like you to do is do the same three breaths Breathe in for four, hold for one, long, slow exhalation for eight, hold. And see if there are any changes in your pulse as you do this exercise this time. Don't count your pulse. Just notice any changes as you breathe in and breathe out. OK, go ahead and do three more breaths. Okay, that should be about enough time for many of you. We have another poll. What did you notice about your pulse? That it speeded up as you exhaled, it slowed down as you exhaled, or you couldn't find your pulse and you got more distracted and anxious? So people are, are voting. I'm just going to take another moment. Sorry for the silence while people are noticing. We're getting. Um, so a lot of people notice that their pulse slowed down as you exhaled. And that is wonderful. So this is a biofeedback loop where basically 
by noticing your pulse, you can notice that you have your heart rate, your pulse has slowed, your, which is your heart rate. So you have basically just slowed your heart rate, and that is a whole cascade then that's, that starts a whole cascade of responses in your body called the relaxation response. Um, and it's, it um, basically gets your parasympathetic nervous system um, on, on active, which is, is your rela way of relaxing. These kind of breathing, so that uh, took a very short amount of time. Um, does anybody have any sense of how long the three breaths took? If you do have any sense of it, just write it in. Um, and while you're doing that, I can give you examples of when this helps when you have a meeting that's about to make you anxious. When somebody has asked you to do something and you are not sure about what they're asking. When you're like me and you have to drive through a tunnel, it's a great way to, to slow it down. Um, so somebody put in 30 seconds. And basically, depending on your breathing, it's about 30 to 45 seconds. Um, and so that is under three minutes of your day if you practice three breaths three times a day. Um, and most people can take a minute three times a day, under, or less than a minute, to practice this breathing exercise. What breathing does, conscious breathing, it gives you a break from your busy mind and complex feelings and gives you a few moments to just be aware of the breath coming in and going out. It's more than a timeout, it enriches you. This is, for those of you that have uh, studied any mindfulness, it is kind of the core mindfulness tool. Breathing also slows your fight-flight response. Many of you, most of you probably know about fight flight, but basically it's a primitive brain response to a threat where our bodies instantly are ready to fight the threat, maybe a saber-toothed tiger, um, or to flee into a cave so that we're not dinner for the saber-toothed tiger. What's remarkable is our lower brain stem, which is the most primitive part of our brain, takes over when we think we're in harm's way, and it does an amazing thing. In order to get us to pay attention to the threat and not dither around, it shuts down our higher level thinking, our frontal lobes. That way we don't stop to think, we just react to get to safety, um, to fight or to fight. And the problem is that as um, relatively sophisticated humans in um, you know, 2018, our bodies and brains are still reacting as if they're saber-toothed tigers when mostly the threats in our lives are traffic, arguments, self-imposed stress, or teenagers storming out of the house. But we still can't think because it shut, the amygdala has shut us down. We can't problem solve or use our frontal lobes, which house our executive functioning. Breathing actually can reset that. It's quite remarkable. Mindful breathing slows it by triggering your vagus nerve, and I'm going to do one more shout out um, to, to our biology, which is the vagus nerve, um, it, which is also called the caretaking nerve. It's the tenth cranial nerve, and it's the longest nerve in the human body. It l is long, it meanders all the way from our brainstem to the heart, to the lungs, and to our gut. It affects breathing, heart rate, your GI system, and more. And by just breathing consciously the way we practice, you increase your vagal tone, which tells your heart to relax. It tells your digestive system to relax, and it reduces inflammation. Bonus, it also increases our sense of humanity and well-being, as it's connected to the hormone oxytocin, also called the love hormone, which um, is strongly experienced by new parents. And then the rest of us forget about it and need to breathe to, to recover it. And somebody mentioned emotional hijacking. Thank you. Yes, we do get emotionally hijacked. Um, and that's a, a great term for fight flight. So I recommend breathing three times three, three breaths, three times a day. It's quick. And think about now good times of the day to practice it. Maybe as you get ready for work or at lunch, um, and then as you prepare to head out of work. Once you breathe mindfully for three breaths, you have an opportunity to focus. We know something about focus and mind wandering. 
When our minds wander, we often think about unpleasant things, our worries, our anxieties, our regrets. And research that's being done by Matt Killingsworth, it's an ongoing study actually, uh, he reports that our minds are wandering 47% of the time, so just about half of the time we're not present, we're wandering. Imagine what we could accomplish if we really could focus our attention. No matter what it's on, a cloud, the smell of our coffee, an interaction, a plan, or how to succeed at rebalancing this year. Another uh, quote from Matt Killingsworth Research, happiness may have more to do with the contents of our moment-to-moment -moment experiences than with the major conditions of our lives. So let's check in again on our life values pie chart. Think about how you can pull more of one of your key values into your daily life. What do you care about? So right now, take one of your new breaths and think about one of your values. Choose one. Think about where in your day you insert this value and hence more of your best self. It doesn't take long. That's kind of the key to this. It doesn't mean finding an hour for something or taking an hour from something else. It means being present and choosing what's important to you for even a minute or two or three. So here's another tool that can help you with focusing on uh, the mind wandering. And this is an exercise called Three Good Things. And I am going to read it. I don't tend to read slides directly, but I am going to read this one. This is from um, the uh, uh, Greater Good Science Center at University of California, Berkeley, um, who are generating an enormous amount of research on all things well-being. And it's called Three Good Things. The what of it is each day write down three good things that went well for you that day. You can provide an explanation for why they went well. It is important to write these down, not just think them. The why of it, it helps you focus on the positive, not just the negative of your day. It begins to train your mind to remember the positive when you're losing ground to the negative. And it helps you appreciate the small things which can contribute to well-being along with the big things. In our day-to-day -day lives, it's easy to get caught up in the things that go wrong, and we can feel like we're living under our own private rain cloud. At the same time, we tend to adapt to the good things and to the people in our lives and take them for granted. As a result, we often overlook everyday beauty and goodness, the kind gesture from a loved one or stranger, the warmth of a heater on a chilly morning, and we miss opportunities. This happiness practice guards against these tendencies. By remembering and listing three good things that have happened in your day and considering what caused them, you tune into the sources of goodness in your life. It's a habit that can change the emotional tone of your life, replacing feelings of disappointment or entitlement with those of gratitude. It can also help when you're mind wandering during the day and as Killingsworth pointed out, you tend to wander to the negative. It can help you retool and focus on, oh, what's one of the three good things I'm going to write about this evening? They don't have to be three life-changing events. Really, sometimes for my, my practice with this, I write down, I had a great shower this morning, that kind of day. But it can be as simple as washing the dishes when it was someone else's job or letting a song wash over you and take you away for a minute or two. Other minis, you can't do this alone. Rebalancing would be much easier if we lived on an island. For this practice, you choose two or three people in your life. Different parts of your life is best. It could be a spouse, a parent, a child, a boss, a coworker, a friend, a co-volunteer. And there are a couple of questions I want you to ask them. Ask them if they can help you with your New Year's project of getting more work-life balance. Tell them you're not ready to change anything yet. You're just collecting data, like a detective or a journalist or a scientist. Ask them, how do you think I'm doing with work-life balance in general and in our relationship? Ask them, what would make it better from your perspective? 
and finally asked them, Is there any help you could give me that would make it better for you and for me? So how do you think I'm doing with work-life balance in general in our relationship? What would make it better from your perspective? And is there any help that you can give me? So think about who you could talk to and ask those key questions. And then there's the issue of saying no that uh, somebody brought up earlier. In order to be our best self and be in charge of the balance in your world, you can't say yes to everything. When someone asks us to do something, we say yes for many reasons. These could be, we're not thinking, we're just on automatic pilot. We want to please the person. We don't want to hurt someone. We don't want conflict. Or we think we can fit in one more thing in our already full 48-hour day. Or we have forgotten how to say no with grace. But if we say yes all the time, we won't have any time for ourselves. And we can start to get resentful and overwhelmed. Saying no is a skill to build and practice. Learning to say no thoughtfully is hard to do. When asked by a family member for one more ride or a favor for a friend or an extra couple of hours at work, first take your time. Don't respond right away. Say, I need to think about this. Thank you for asking. I will get back to you. So you've pressed your pause button. Then, since you've taken off the pressure to respond right away, take time and evaluate if you have the time and energy to really do this. Does it work for you? And what will you have to trade to do this? Then think about if you can do it with grace. Check back in with your values and your time pie charts. Will saying no a bit more in your week give you more energy and time for the things that energize you. So there are many ways to say no gracefully. And I'm just going to give you one, um, more ex one example. And certainly feel free to type in some of your own examples. Um, but one way is to say, thank you for asking. I would love to, but it's just not a good time right now. This may be uncomfortable for some of you. So we're going to take a moment and talk about guilt. We can get guilt from saying no. We can get woman and mom shamed when we're getting all of the, message this, the messages that we aren't doing enough to be the perfect mother, wife, coworker, community member, that we're not getting it all done with a smile on our face, and that we are not hiding our exhaustion and sometimes our exasperation. We can get man and dad shamed when we are seen as shirking on work responsibilities, when we show up at a kid event where there are only mothers, where we are told on the one hand, all you should be doing is providing for the family. And on the other hand, you now need to be the perfect juggler, just like many of the women have been trying to do for so long. This, this gets us to how we feel about saying no, holding our heads up high, taking a deep breath, and looking guilt in the eye. This quote has been very important to me over the years because I can beat myself up with guilt as good as anybody. So I've actually written this quote down um, so that I can look at it when I'm noticing the guilt building. And as you can see, it says, guilt is good if it lasts for no longer than five minutes and brings a change in behavior. Try writing it down and practicing it. So here are some more minis for maintaining uh, your personal balance, especially when other people in your lives aren't balanced. One is to count to 24 hours. Usually we're told to count to 10, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, when we're angry or about to say something negative. I don't know about you, but that has never worked for me. Um, sometimes it makes me even more emotional. The goal is to wait until you cool down until the wave of emotion subsides. You can't problem solve effectively when you're emotional. So wait. And if after 24 hours you're still emotional, wait another 24 hours. You're up to 48 hours. And maybe it needs to go 72 hours. If you still remember why you were ticked off in the first place, it may be then good to talk and problem solve. Otherwise, it's often good to let it go. 
Don't make assumptions. I call this the Columbo technique. And this is based on the Peter Falk TV series where he was a disheveled detective. I don't know if any of you remember. And he would always act kind of dumb, scratch his head and say, help me understand. If we use this one question of basic curiosity when we're about to assume why someone in our lives is doing something negative, or why they're giving us extra work or not getting homework done or even cutting into line in front of us, if we just ask to them, help me understand, you may be surprised at the answer. So cheerleaders, Sue and Joanne are friends. Sue's feeling overwhelmed with all she has to do and all she wants to do is put her head under the covers and not come out till spring. Joanne's feeling unappreciated and is getting grumpy. They have coffee together and both start complaining about all they need to do and how no one at work or home appreciate them. They both get the same idea at the same time, to appreciate each other and get people in each of the other parts of their lives to be part of their appreciation cheerleading team. They leave for the rest of their day energized and happier. Get your team in place and give it back and say thank you. And believe it or not, social media, which seems to do this, which seems to be our cheerleaders, actually doesn't have the same positive and long-lasting impact as in face-to-face -face or phone call interactions. Okay, take a break. This is the pause button. You will anyway. So feel good about your break, your time off, whether it's five minutes or 15 minutes. Use it as a time to breathe, and the same old tasks can actually look better after a real break. Have a ritual for leaving work at work. We often carry home the emotional wear and tear of our days, especially when we work with people and care for people. Humans are amazingly empathic, which means that feelings are catchy, just like colds are catchy. We can often be like a sponge, absorbing someone's sadness, their distress, their fear, their anger. We help them, but then we're stuck with feeling like we're a sponge full of feelings. What's your ritual for leaving work at work? How do you wring out your emotional sponge? Um, you know, feel free to type in what you do. Um, one of my main ways, I have two, one is as soon as I get home, I change into my grubby dog walking clothes and take my dog for a walk. And that, that's pretty effective. And finally, don't sweat the small stuff. This is a book by Dr. Richard Carlson and a whole series of books he wrote, actually, starting with Don't Sweat the Small Stuff, and it's all small stuff. Simple ways to keep the little things from taking over your life. It reminds you about what is important in your life, about keeping everything in perspective which is another balance tool. And somebody out there has read it and agrees that it's a great book. And there's a workbook, and there are just all these great tools that he provides, has provided. And now I'm going to read you a story. OK, it's always good to have story time, no matter how old you are, right? This is a story called A Heavy Load. It's a, from a book called Zen Shorts, and it's a, a little parable. Two traveling monks reached a town where there was a young woman waiting to step out of her sedan chair. The rains had made deep puddles, and she couldn't step across without spoiling her silken robes. She stood there looking very cross and impatient. She was scolding her attendants. They had nowhere to place the packages they held for her, so they couldn't help her cross the puddle. The younger monk noticed the woman, said nothing, and walked by. The older monk quickly picked her up, her on his back, transported her across the water, and put her down on the other side. She didn't thank the older monk. She just shoved him out of the way and departed. As they continued on their way, the young monk was brooding and preoccupied. After several hours, unable to hold his silence, he spoke out. That woman back there was very selfish and rude, but you picked her up on your back and carried her, and then she didn't even thank you. I set the woman down hours ago, the older monk replied. Why are you still carrying her? So a reminder to all of us to let go when we're aware of carrying things we don't need to carry. Take three breaths. Decrease whining, increase gratitude. 
and take time to rebalance. Heading into 2018, choose one or two of these things to focus on that we talked today. Breathing three conscious breaths three times a day. Writing down three good things. Try it for a week. You can actually start it right now if you want. Write down one or two good things from your day so far. And I so know some of you it's very early and some of you it's midday. But try it as an exercise. Write down one or two good things from your day so far and finish it up before you go to sleep tonight. Ask for help, get feedback, get support for your rebalancing. Practice saying, no, thank you. I would love to, but it's just not a good time right now. And then all of the internal balance exercise in terms of relationships with others. A reminder from Richard Carlson, we become what we practice the most. Are you practicing your values? What are you going to practice? Right now, we have some time. Think about one thing you're going to do differently tomorrow based on what you've heard today. Please feel free to write it into the chat and we can discuss. We can spend a little time talking about um, what, you, what you think about doing differently tomorrow. And some of you might have your own minis that you do, like posting a post-it on your mirror at some people. And I think I missed some of the other things that people put in. Um, but um, please feel free to post your minis or what you're thinking of, of doing. Living, great, one person saying she's going to live her values. So another person learning to let it go. Yeah. Which often starts with a breath and breathing when I start to feel overwhelmed. So those are great things to start practicing tomorrow or today. Somebody's saying, I tend to take work home too much. I'm going to try to stop doing that. And that's one way to think about that is the sponge or whatever metaphor works for you for leaving work at work. Um, and saying no and trying not to feel guilty about saying no. Practicing five minutes of guilt is, um, is, is a good practice when you're feeling guilty. And then you go, okay, I did my five minutes. What did I learn? What can I do different? How do I move on? Um, I'm sorry, I'm missing some of these, but asking for help, great, from some, some of the people in your life so you're not feeling alone with it. Connecting. Connecting is, is the core. Again, from the Science of Happiness course, it's a ni there's a nine-week Science of Happiness course that I have to put a plug in because it was transformational for me to take this course. It's a free course through edX, uh, through the, uh, UC Berkeley. Um, and they just spend a lot of time talking about really the core of, of happiness is, is community, is social. Um, <laughs> Remind yourself to put the woman down, yes, not to be caring so much and spend more time with people who are uplifting. Yes, and that's that's something that I didn't bring up, but thank you for bringing that up. Uh, three good things, yes, changing the memory of the negative to the positive. So we have biological set points, they think. They think it's happiness is genetic. Um, which is really depressing for some of us that were born with, with less of the, the happiness genes. Um, but many of these practices can actually help change your set point, um, which again allows you to bring more and to do those constant rebalancing all day. And one person's curious about what we say, work-life balance rather than life-work balance. I prefer to put the, fr <laughs> the life first, yes. I'm with you. Um, sometimes it's harder to sell in the workplace. Um, I do a, I do a lot of um, a work at um, uh, on flexibility and having a flexible workplace. And I don't know what what all of you deal with with that, but um, 
it is changing a, a culture at MIT to, to create a more uh, flexible work arrangements in terms of where you work, how you work, and when, when you work. And that brings in just that question about, well, is it work-life balance or life-work balance? And, and how do we uh, meet the needs of, of everybody, including ourselves? So that looks like the end of the comments. And so I'm going to stop talking. But thank you all, your fabulous um, audience, fabulous participants. I was told that you're an active group, and you are. And on a webinar, that's a challenge. So thank you so very much. And thank have a you, lovely Dr. Littman. This has been a really great session. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Laura. No, I'm just, I'm done. Thank you so much. All right. Well, thank you. This has been a really refreshing and rejuvenating um, session, and we're really excited that this was one of our first ones to kick off for military caregiving, caregiving for the new year. And so I appreciate your time today. I did have one question. You mentioned that Core of Happiness course that UC Berkeley um, came out with that was um, available and you took advantage of. Is there any way that we could find out more information about that course, or could you provide us with a link to learn more? Yeah, it's on that resource list that I provided to you. Okay. Did you get Perfect. that? Perfect. Yeah, well, it's an okay. online course. Um, it's it's. Um, I, I I created the resource list: articles and research, books, organizations, research and statistics, and uh, online course. And it does tell you everything about the science of happiness. And for those of you that need CEUs, you can get a ton of CEUs, like. 15 or something for $200. Um, and it took me, I have to say it's a nine week course, it took me about four months. Um, but that's okay because it's online. Oh, okay, Rachel, you put it up. Thank you. Yes, yeah, thank you. And all of these resources, we have a list of resources that Dr. Littman provided us as well as some additional um, resources. Um, all are on our Learn Event page, and so if you go down to the very bottom, you're able to download today's presentation slides as well as additional resources and information on caregiver burnout, different books and articles that um, Dr. Littman provided. So please um, check that out for more information if you'd like to learn a little bit more. This has been a really great session, and I appreciate all the positive feedback and the engagement from everyone today. As we close out, I just wanted to let you know that we are offering our concentration area offers one CE credit from the UT School of Social Work. It's a national accredited association for credentialed participants um, in social work, but also um, they do accept other associations through that social work credit, so you just have to work with your state association to get approval, and, but normally that um, goes through just fine. Again, it's a national accredited association from the UT School of Social Work. Um, we also offer CE, or excuse me, certificates of completion. So if you're just looking for a general certificate of completion for training hours, we do offer that as well. And so in order to do so, um, for CE or certificates, you will need to complete the link that's provided both to myself and Coral in the chat pod. And you also can find this information on the PowerPoint slides as well if you download at the Learn Event page for more information. As we close out today's session, feel free to continue posting in the chat pod, but we do want to remind you to join us um, next month. We'll be focusing on how providers can support advocacy and leadership in parents of children with disabilities. So that one will be starting at 2 p.m. Eastern Time on February 28th. And so if you are interested, especially those exceptional family members, um, please join us. I think it'll be a, a good session uh, and good information. So I've posted that link in the chat pod as well. Again, that will be available on our PowerPoint slides. So if you've missed any of these links that are coming in through the chat pod, please note they're all on this Learn event page. Um, Barb, it's noon to 1 p.m. Eastern. So it's just a 60-minute presentation. Um, and so hopefully that'll work out for you guys. Great. All right. And just to close out, get connected with our concentration area on social media. Um, online, we provide monthly 60-minute webinars on 
on a variety of topical errors or areas, excuse me. Um, and so please get connected and join us. As we close out today, let us know if you have any questions. I'll also type my email address in the chat pod. So if you have any issues with CE credits or certificates of completion, or if you're unable to find all of these resources, um, just send me an email and I'll help you out. That won't be a problem. So again, thank you for participating um, in today's session. Thank you, Dr. Littman, for this really engaging, informative, and just refreshing webinar today. We really appreciate it, and we're really excited to kick off 2018. Thank you, Rachel. Great. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Dr. Oh, Littman. It was Barra. I was just saying thank you. It was wonderful doing this with all of you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. We so enjoyed having you, and I'm I know that I personally uh, got a, quite a bit out of this session, so thank you. Um, I did want to mention to our participants that, again, we did record today's session, so if you would like to share this recording with any of your colleagues uh, or anybody else who might uh, benefit from this information, we will be posting that recording here in the next business day or two to that learn.extension.org URL that uh, we have referenced a couple times. Also, uh, the slides and other resources are available there as well and will remain posted. So we will keep the room open for just another minute or two in case you need to grab any last minute links from the chat pod. Uh, and thank you again so much for joining us today. Thank you again, Dr. Logan, for sharing your expertise and to the military caregiving team for hosting today's webinar. So we hope you enjoyed it and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Have a great rest of your day.